Hello everyone and welcome to another video and what is another episode of What's Inside. Now in this series we purchase cheap secondhand pre-built PCs with the sole intention of finding out what's inside them and then seeing how well the combination of components can play games. Today I picked up this cheap secondhand pre-built at CEX here in the UK and I plan to find out exactly what's inside this thing and then see how well it can handle itself in both CPU intensive tasks and modern AAA titles. Now CEX here in the UK, as I'm sure most of you know by now, is a secondhand electronics retailer. You can buy PCs, you can buy laptops, you can buy phones, but their PCs are of the most interest to me because it's always a mystery as to the exact specs that you might get. Whilst the basic specifications are listed on the site, the minor details such as the PSU model, or actually rather major details in some cases, are pretty lacklustre in terms of description. So the exact model of the RAM, the exact model of the power supply, and the exact model of the hard drive or SSD that you're going to get remains a mystery until you take that side panel off. So let's get into it and do just that. I actually had a little bit of trouble with this initial step because, well, it seems like someone had welded it on, but after a little bit of brute force, it was time to see what lay inside this mysterious chassis? There are also no pictures of specific items on the CEX site either, which makes it all the more of a surprise when it turns up. You guys know that we don't only do this to solve a specific curiosity, but to also discover how well a set of specifications work together, and review, if you will, the system as a whole, as well as the system builder's choices. So after struggling with the side panel, and finally managing to loosen it up, it was time to reveal the hidden treasures buried deep inside this dented black and red case. The first noteworthy component is the power supply, a Corsair TX650M. It's 80 plus gold rated and it's modular, and to be honest it's overkill for this PC, but at least a more powerful GPU could be utilised, or at least it could have been if we had the GPU cables. If it was me, I'd have plugged them in even if my GPU didn't need them so that I didn't lose them, but obviously that is not what happened here. Buying a replacement cable or cables shouldn't cost too much and I think you can get them from the Corsair website. This is a quality unit and one I'd still very much recommend. Brand new you can expect to pay at least £70. Used units will be cheaper but be sure they come with all the cables that you require. Finds like this are why I like purchasing CEX PCs. The exact PSU model is never listed and sometimes it can be a very pleasant surprise, though the opposite is sometimes true. I should also take a minute to talk about the case before getting carried away with the internal components. More often than not, at least in my experience, a secondhand pre-built will be a little bit marked and scratched, maybe even dented like this one, and this has been the case for me, pardon the pun, on a lot of occasions, no matter where I've been buying. Be aware of this if you plan on buying a pre-owned PC, as it may not be the most pretty looking externally, but most sites should have pictures and detailed info regarding condition. Back to the interior, and there's nothing exciting going on in the way of liquid cooling. There's no RGB either. What sort of a monster? I'm liking the bright red finish at the back of the case though, it's not for everyone I know but it does match the stock AMD CPU fan rather well. I'm sure a lot of you are expecting to see an AMD FX processor at this point, right? Well what we actually have here is an FM2 Plus socket board. Now FM2 Plus supported AMD's 2014 lineup of APUs as well as a range of Athlon chips which were inexpensive and therefore ideal for users on a tight budget. Those who built an FM2 based PC back in 2014 would likely have realised the restrictions of that socket by now. Take the X4860K for example, by coincidence the very Athlon chip attached to this board. This one is in particular need of some new thermal paste. Whilst it was a good budget conscious decision back in the day to buy one of these, it was also one of the best CPUs on the socket. These both sound like positive factors, but when it came to upgrading, there wasn't really anywhere to go whereas the opposite was true for anyone who bought the Intel alternative, the G3258. It will be interesting to see how this 3.7GHz Kaveri quad-core performs today. 
These days I'd consider 8GB of RAM the minimum for any gaming PC, with 16 gigs the sweet spot. Thankfully inside this build we do have two sticks of memory, a promising start, and upon closer inspection we have two matching sticks of 1600MHz DDR3. Next up it's the best part, the graphics card. This tiny unassuming component doesn't look like much but it's actually a GTX 1050 Ti. This £139 or dollar card was heralded by some reviewers as the new budget king back in 2016 and whilst it still costs over 100 of most currencies to buy new, there are plenty of them on the used market thanks to its popularity. After all, it's still the second favourite amongst gamers who take part in Steam's monthly hardware survey. This Inno 3D compact version requires no 6 pin connector and thanks to its small size could likely be squeezed into many type for space rigs. To finalise on the spec front we have a 500GB hard drive and an ASUS DVD drive, great for anyone like me with a large disc based game collection. An SSD would be a welcome improvement here. An exhaust fan would also be a nice addition to keep things a little cooler. Always be sure to give a second hand PC a good clean as well to remove any loose dust, as this can make things a little hot if it gets a bit clogged up. So we know the specs, but how well can they game? Is this a capable combination these days, or will one component prove to be the limiting factor? Cough cough, X4860K. Well, why don't we fire up some games and CPU intensive tasks to find out. So I started with video editing with Premiere Pro CC 2015, and there are no two ways about this. Using this CPU for editing this very video was a pretty horrible experience. Now, even in one quarter resolution playback, there will be stutters, there will be audio problems, and none of this is present after exporting the video, but trying to actually preview the video and cut and crop your various clips can be a bit of a pain in the air. Anyway, let's move on to the Cinebench R20 result. As you can see, the multi-core score here was worse than that of an overclocked FX 4300. And as I'm sure you guys probably remember, that didn't do the best when it came to running modern games. So for the gaming tests, I started off with Assassin's Creed Odyssey at 1080p low and running the in-game benchmark test, we were able to achieve 32 FPS on average. Now you'll probably notice there in the top left corner that the CPU is running at 100% usage and this is a similar story throughout all of today's gameplay tests. It simply cannot handle a lot of modern games that well, whereas we know that the 1050 Ti still can. Now whilst you could still probably get away with playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey on this setup, Battlefield 5 is a different story. Again, the 1050 Ti is the better component throughout and it is still very much capable of running modern titles with reduced settings, but the X4860K here struggled especially in Battlefield 5 where we were seeing just 22 frames per second with pretty poor 1% and 0.1% lows as well. According to the FRAFS benchmark program, we were seeing 64 frames per second in Crisis 3, again at 1080p low. Now, this didn't really feel like we were hitting 64 frames per second on average. That may be because of the low 1% low there. 28 and 26 indicates no real stutter, but it does mean that we saw a few frame drops here and there, and they will certainly be noticeable as the action starts to heat up. Far Cry New Dawn felt like the smoothest of all of today's tested games but again in busier areas you will notice the frame rate start to drop i think i saw around 30 fps at one point which isn't bad but going straight from 48 to 30 in an instant is certainly something that's quite noticeable when you're running around blasting your way throughout this in-game map so that's something to bear in mind with a 0.1% of 13 you'll certainly notice a few frame dips here and there and finally, I'd be inclined to call Red Dead Redemption 2 unplayable as well, thanks to the low average frame rate. There wasn't too much stutter, but overall, it was quite a slow experience. Red Dead Redemption 2 isn't the most fast-paced game in the world, but it's nice to be able to hit at least 30, and unfortunately, 30 FPS was not achievable here, even with the lowest performance preset. So I think we can all agree that this PC has one major flaw, or two. 
And those are the CPU and the motherboard. The X4860K is still capable of handling some games, though when it comes to others such as Battlefield 5 or Red Dead Redemption 2, it will certainly struggle. We know that the 1050 Ti can still deliver playable frame rates with reduced settings when paired with a more capable processor, but in the case of this system, well, it is being held back by the X4. So why did I buy this PC? Well, I knew the basic specs of this machine and considering it had a 1050 Ti inside for the price of £175, I had a feeling there was some profit to be made. I wanted to wait and see what other specs would be included with this build and I think now that I've seen the power supply that's inside I could probably make my money back and a little bit more which is what I intended to do in the first place and I plan to turn that concept into another video. I also wanted to answer the question can the X4860K still handle itself in early 2020 and the answer to that is unfortunately no. If you want to build a budget focused PC that includes the 1050 Ti among the specs well I would strongly consider pairing it with a Ryzen 3 for example, or an Intel Core i3, perhaps the 9100F. The problem with the FM2 Plus socket is that there really isn't anywhere else to go. The X4860K is one of the best chips available, and so when it comes to upgrading, I'm sure the person who built this probably just thought, well, I'm not going to get a new motherboard and CPU, I'm just going to build a whole entire new PC, and they most likely upgraded their 1050 Ti as well. They should have kept the power supply though, that can handle pretty much any single card out there. Well with all that said and done I hope you've enjoyed this video, I always enjoy taking a look at these pre-built machines, seeing what's inside and I hope you guys do too. If you like this video be sure to leave a like on it, leave a dislike if you didn't, sorry if you can hear the X4860K's fan, those stock fans really are quite awful, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and hopefully you can all join me in the next one.